God have mercy on us all. That's good. Oh, and you can get listen up for only fourteen ninety nine. So thank you for joining today on Pot Have Mercy as Matt Russell starts the interview with our friend and brother Moses uh, before we're recording. That's really good. It's helpful to everybody hey, who's listening. Moses is so interesting. I just I've got to get a jump on this so, job. Yeah. <laughs> we want to. Well, we're joined today by I'm going to say it. I'm going to try my best. Moses and Jobu. You got it. Did I do well? Yeah, yeah. Look almost, John. I, I would say almost. Almost. You see almost. Yeah. yeah how, well, how would you say it? It's in Jobu. In Jobu. You have to go so smooth. You see, in Jobu. Yeah, I'm not very smooth. <laughs> no, no, <that's> <laughs> <laughs> Moses is so. This week we have a special kind of um, opportunity to sit and visit with Moses mm-hmm. and hear about all the great things that he does in Malawi, Africa. But just so you know, uh, our Chapelwood Foundation uh, has their annual uh, banquet mm-hmm. this week. Yes. And Moses is one of the global grant recipients for the Chapwood Foundation. Mm. And so he is coming to visit in Houston. Yes. He, I, I believe you're going to be speaking and sharing a little yes. bit about the ministry. And so you've also been able to travel around and see some things in Houston and at Chapwood and some of our partners. But I thought I'd start by mm. just asking you to just tell us about yourself, where you're from, your growing up years. Yes. and. Then we'll get into kind of what led you into your ministry and the difference you're making in Malawi. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am Moses Njovu. I am from Malawi, Africa. Mm. I'm married. I have three kids, two girls, beautiful girls, and Mm. one handsome boy. Uh, The girls, uh, one is 20, the other one is 19. My boy is 12. Wow. Moses does not look old enough to have a twenty. No, no, no. I'm, I, I am. I am. I am forty-five. <laughs> you look twenty. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> right. right. <laughs> I, do I look that young? You look younger. You look t- young. Uh, the Lord is taking that's care good. of me. You're blessed. Yeah, the Lord is taking good care of me. Yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah. So basically, that's who I am. Uh, um, growing up, yeah, I, I I come from a family where my dad was a, an abuser, very mm. abusive, a uh, drunkard, a womanizer. And uh, back home, uh, 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 men are allowed to marry even one or two wives. My dad had five wives. Whoa. Can you imagine that? He had mm-hmm. five wives. I have a hard time with one wife. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's, uh, that's the story. So, uh, And it was very hard for him to take care of um, us, of especially course. that he was a drunkard and a womanizer. We didn't get the support that we needed to do. And mm-hmm. uh, that really made my life very difficult. And it's by the grace of God that I am who I am today because um, I believe uh, God spoke to some people and people listened to my story, saw what I was going through and did something. Mm -hmm. And that's the theme of um, my travel to the U.S. this time around. I'm just calling everyone to say, hey, let's stop. Let's listen. Let's do something. That's what Christ did in Mm -hmm. all his ministry on earth. The, uh, the blind man, son of David, have mess on me. He had to listen. He stopped, Stop. listened, and did something. Yeah. So yeah, basically, just a little bit about me. How did how did you come to faith? Wow. I mean, your experience with uh, an abusive father and a the, the household that you grew up in. How did you come to faith in your Christian faith? And and then yeah. what kind of led you into a calling? How did God call you to? do the ministry which we're going to talk about that you're engaged in yeah so basically came a time when my dad lost his job and um, all the five all the four women dumped him (laughs) you know the story when you don't have money (laughs) yeah so the five the four women dumped him my mom remained with him Mm. and um, he couldn't pay bills in town we were supposed to move into the village and my sister said, there's no way we're going to the village because he's only my only brother who is in school. I want to support him with school. So my sister and I remained in, in, in the city. She was taking good care of me, supporting me, giving me what I needed in school. Mm. But you know what? She was 18, I was 12. Mm. Child-headed household. And then it, time, it came a time when she got sick. And I remember on the sick bed, her telling me, Moses, I'm dying. I didn't understand what she meant until she opened up to me and said, all the food you've been eating, all the money I've been sending you to school with, it's because I'd sold my body into prostitution. Mm. 
she was literally selling her body to men so they give her money so she can provide for me and have an education <laughs> and i lost her because she sacrificed her life so i can be who i am today mm. so fast forward the story i'm in town my sister is gone i become a street kid i'm doing whatever i can do survive sell on the street do whatever i can do and then this primary school teacher spots me and says oh, you are intelligent but i see what you're going through so he started she started supporting me as well i remember her trying to buy me a pair of shoe can you imagine at 13 12 you trying to buy a pair of shoe and i didn't i had not known a shoe by then so they came and measured my 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 foot with a string <laughs> they measured my foot with a string because i didn't know my my foot size so they took mm-hmm. that string to the grocery store bought a shoe and brought it to me it felt like christmas putting on a shoe for the first time how old were you by, by then i was 12 still and then and then <coughs> This teacher of mine invited me to several meetings. We co- we used to call them scripture union meetings where mm. young men gathered and they they read through the scripture and uh, shared the word. You know, I was faithfully going to these meetings, faithfully. Whenever it's Friday I would be the first one to be in that classroom. But you know why? Because they were giving out free food. Mm. I wanted to have access to food which was served there. Mm. Little did I know that by attending those meetings Christ was waiting for me mm. and it's through those meetings that Christ was preached to me and I became born again and that changed the way I looked at things changed my lifestyle so again fast for, fast forward the story by the grace of God I get into college I'm a security guard I got a scholarship as a watchman so in the during the day I'm in class at night I'm at work guarding So in my last semester of school I visited my father in the village. Mm. Now I'm a big boy and he's scared <laughs> he's thinking oh maybe he's brought up he's going to to fight me because I abandoned him. But no I did <clears> not do that. And that attracted my dad to me. He started asking stories from his friends. Why is my child so different? And his friend told him, "You know what? Your son has Christ. He is very different because he has he has Jesus with him." So he said call him I want to know more about this Jesus of his so I invited me in several days later I started sharing with him the the word of God and believe me you he became born again <laughs> this is a man who was abusive a man who was a, a womanizer a drunkard he becomes born again and later in his life he became a local pastor and he died as a local pastor <laughs> so that's the motivation These stories that I have is the motivation that l- led me to start a ministry. Mm. Because I said in my lifetime I don't want to see girls sell themselves prostitution the way my sister did. I don't want to see women being abused by men the way my mom was being abused. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see men like my dad. I want to be a different man. I don't want to see children die of hunger. And that's why we be- the minist- the ministry of Banana Life Center was Beth. So your ministry is Abundant Life Center. Yes. And it is uh is it in Mitundu? It's in Mitundu, yes, Lilongwe. In, in, in Lilongwe. Mm-hmm. I'm learning it to to speak what is it Malawi? Chichewa. Chichewa. Yeah, but <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> but I'm not smooth but at that. But uh yeah, so it's interesting like your journey. Mhm. Um, you know the way we Methodists we we call it prevenient grace yes, it's the grace of yes. God at work in your life before yes. you even know mm. that God's at work in your yes. life but it is God at work in yes. your life and um this is what led you your experiences your conversion this experience with this reconciliation mm-hmm. with your father and yes. his conversion but talk about abundant life center the ministries that you are engaged in the community based work because it sounds like from the way i read and understand that a lot of this is is come out of your experience yes but mm. also as you've been transformed in christ out of abuse and neglect and yeah a lot of the things that you personally walk through and experience mm. are some of the things that you now are in ministry addressing, addressing. to heal yes. huh. so basically as i told you i wanted to see a society that is different 
and the ministry was best. What, what, how we started is we just started with outreach, <laughs> reaching out to communities around us, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But as we were doing that, we realized that it's not just about the gospel. Yeah. It's about reaching the entire person mm. holistically. Mm. So just as Jesus did the Jesus model where he fed, he taught, and he healed, we feel that's our call. That's our calling to humanity. We need to feed, we need to teach, we need to heal. So after outreach, we started feeding the children. Our first session had only 500 children that came for the feeding, feeding program that day, 500. And over the years, we've grown now to feeding over 4,000 children every day, one meal a day. So that's basically targeting these children because they are our window of hope. We realize they are window of hope. Once you build a good foundation with them, believe me, you a generation we are going to raise in the future who won't have polygamous men, who won't have abu abusive men, who won't have girls that will be easily be sold into uh, in pro into prostitution. So we want to build that basic solid foundation for them. One with education, two with discipleship and spiritual development for them as young people. Mm. So that's just one component of the ministry, the feeding program. But you know, being holistic, we're looking at looking at the all the other aspects of a human being. So we also have what we call the girls program. Uh, the girls program basically it's about empowering the girls with surviving skills, economic surviving skills. They can make back scones, do sewing and tailoring, and by doing that, they take to the market and have some income. So the girl is not tempted to sleep with a man because she has money. Mm. So she's not tempted to go for a man because she's already made her own income. Mm. So we are doing that, but also we're trying to encourage them with education. Girls back home drop out of school when they get into fifth grade. Wow. There are a lot of challenges that lead them to, to drop out. One is poverty levels. They don't have food. Maybe they are forced to go and look for food mm -hmm. instead of them going to school. The second one is uniforms. For example, when girls become of age, they start uh, uh, monthly periods and they don't have sanitary wear. So they feel shy to go in class with a torn uniform. So they would rather stay back at home. So as a ministry, we're trying to reach out with these issues, like providing them with uniforms and also sanitary pads where they can feel safe and secure to remain in class. So that's the girls program. Uh, we have a women and widows program. <coughs> This is basically fo focusing on the women themselves. Remember, I'm trying to, all these programs are paralleled to what I, go, I went through. Mm -hmm. So this women and widows is a direct uh, confrontation to what my mom went Your through. Your mother. Yeah. Yes, she was abused. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that the women that we work with are, never, are not abused. Why? Well, how? We need to give them a voice. We need to give them a power. Because I live in a male-dominated culture where the men... Mm -hmm. have all the voice, they have all the power, they can say whatever they want to do because they have the money, they have the, the way to raise money. So we want to give these women the economic power that gives them the voice to make decisions at a household level. So we train them in sewing, knitting, baking, and we also give them piglets. <laughs> the piglets they raise and they, they, when, once it litters, they bring back the two piglets back to the center. And we raise it up to six months and we give it back to the society. So it's like a cycle, a revolving pig farming program. So far, we started with two. We've given out over 250 pigs to different women in the, in the community. There, there used to be a pro was it the Heifer Project? Uh -huh. Heifer. Uh -huh. Yeah, the Heifer Project. Yeah, I've heard about Heifer and Program. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. a similar deal where they provide resources for cows and goats and pigs yes. in the community that can help sustain yes. uh, over time. Yes. That's fascinating. I'm, this is great. But I what's mean, interesting, because you're, <clears throat> you're not just providing the meal, mm. you're training up, yeah. you're educating, you're training, but you're also creating an economy type yeah. system yeah. to where they, they're able to take care of themselves. Yeah, that's right. It's like a social entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically yeah, it's small about business. Equip, equipping and empowering. You mm. see, you provide so that they are, themselves become so much empowered. Yeah. Be, because I believe when you're empowered, you can develop. Yes. You can yes. make good decisions. You can, you can be reliable. Community can rely on you because you're empowered. But once you're not empowered, you feel so helpless and you can't do anything. Mm. So that's what we do with the women. We don't just end there, by the way. We also have what we call self-water 
program. People back home still drink from shallow wells. Some communities drink together with the animals. So because of that, there's a lot of waterborne diseases, coral and them. So as a ministry, we saw this as an opportunity where we can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ being the living water. So we make crawling and uh, distribute in, in, in to community members. So we do door to door. So we make a crawl in at a central place, then we start going. My staff and everyone else, volunteers, they go door to door distributing this crawl in. So as they are doing that, they right, are so wait a minute, I'm just, you're just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding that word. Chlorine. 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 Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. That, Sorry. That's, that's African slang. So you can, <laughs> <laughs> you I know, can, I know what it is. I was just, I was, I, the, uh, yeah. the yeah. accent kind of threw me off, but no, okay. I know. So that you, you're providing chlorine for them to clean the water. To, to treat their water. I got you. So as we're doing that, we're going door to door. As we do door to door, we also preach Jesus to them. Because we, before we talk to them about chlorine, we start with the word of God. Do you know that Christ is our living water? And that's our entry point. And from there, we give them the chlorine. As we give the chlorine, we teach them basic health skills, <laughs> basic hygiene skills, how to stay healthy, using locally available resources. We don't have a, a lot of medical care back in the communities, but they are simple Princip traditional principles that you can use to stay healthy. Mm. So those are basic health hygiene that we train them as we give them the crawling. And another program is what we call capacity building. Uh, capacity building is targeting the pastors, the local pastors. We have pastors that have never been to a Bible college. They see us as their Bible college when because we give them the training. Mm. So we train them in simple sermon preparation, for example, church administration, how they, leadership, servant leadership, we give them that training, but also train the traditional leaders. These are our custodian of culture. They are the ones that are, you'd call the mayors of a city, they're in charge of the village. They make the, poly, they make the rules, the bylaws. When you're in yeah. trouble, they give you a fine. Yeah. So we train them in servant leadership, but also preach Christ to them, because these are a neglected part of society back home. Mm. Once you become a chief, it is believed that you are not supposed to go to church. You start mm -hmm. worshiping traditional idols. So mm -hmm. we're reaching to them with the word of God. Out of the 380 that I work with, only 85 have come to Christ. So wow. I still have a lot of work to do wow. with the rest that are remaining. You know, it's important we learned this from uh, Bishop Muyombo in the Congo. Yes. Is yes. that in, in the United States, we use the term traditional Methodist, and that means people who have like a tradition in Africa when you say traditional, traditional. you mm. mean like the mm. tribal religions yes. the tribal faith the tribal uh, politics okay. okay so for Africans when they're when, when Americans are talking about traditional Methodist tra yeah, tradi uh, traditionalist right <laughs> right it doesn't mean the same thing in Please Africa it doesn't translate the same uh, way so yeah so these are the these are the people who protect and uphold the tribal customs yes and probably the tribal religion as well. Yes. So that's why it's hard for them, for them to, to convert. Yes, it's very hard. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. when they convert, it's the whole, it seems like there's a whole implication of the tribe, the status that that person has, who they are. What I mean, it seems like it's a lot happens. Traditionally, have been raised that way, that chiefs don't go to church and they're supposed to uphold the traditional religion. Yes. So once they depart from the traditional religion, is they're like abandoning what their forefathers had raised. Mm -hmm see yes. so basically that's why they find it very hard to to to, to convert mm. yeah that is a hard thing i mm. mean because it'd be like you say it you know it's that's uh your identity yeah yes and, you're, and the that's people right. in your tribe's mm. identity yeah so the, your ministry is i mean i just hear you talk about it and i have a feeling that that's not all <laughs> so no. you've got things with with kids that you're you're feeding four thousand every day every day mm. could you i mean that's just that's amazing to me. Like, do they show up at a facility? Is it part of the school, or how do you do that? So we have four different locations, four okay. different centers, and these kids show up. Some of them will walk about five kilometers, ten kilometers to come to the center to have a meal for ne for the day. So they show up, and um, our ultimate goal, because of the distance they are walking, we are coming up with a children village. We call it Abandoned Life Center Children Village, where they will be housed in one complex and this complex will have about 12 homes 
each home who, 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 who take in about uh, eight, eight orphans. And uh, are these most of these children orphans? Yes, most of them are orphans. We call them orphans and vulnerable children. Mm-hmm. Vulnerable because maybe their parents, or maybe they have one single mom, uh, maybe their parents have, uh, they don't have any source of income. So they become vulnerable because of the situation of their parents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they'll be housed at one complex and uh, we'll have eight homes. We'll have a secondary school there, a primary school there, a church there, uh, a clinic or a community clinic there. And by the grace of God, we've already constructed and opened the community clinic. And uh, we, o- we, o- we have also constructed two homes. We are remaining with 10. Uh, people ask me, why did you rush into the community clinic and not finish the, ho- the other homes? Well, the answer is simple. I've seen kids die from simple curable diseases because the clinic is very far from where they are. I've seen, literally seen women giving birth on their way to the, to the clinic in the bush, in the ox cuts, because the clinic is very far. So for me, a community clinic was a priority so I can mm. save the lives of women, I can save the lives of children that were dying at an early age. So basically that's where we are heading, where we have this complex. And right now we are doing a vocational training, mm. um, which is also underway. We've, da- we've started the foundation. We want to get the young people, get the men, the, the get the women trained in basic hand skills where they can become themselves employable or employ others. Uh, yes. That's great. Yes, yeah, another thing, if you remember uh, Monday when shared with us the the model of of um, planting churches in the United Methodist Church in Africa is very much that seems to be a, a, a model that is used like by you when they come in they don't just plant a church right mm. just start mm. having worship services mm. there's usually um, health care services yes. A school, education, yes, food, yes, uh, a well, yes, and often a well, yes, for water, and then the church comes up in this these complexes, if you will, yes, but they're the whole person, yes, body, mm. like you said, yes. and that's that's very to me very much of a a biblical model of evangelism, mm-hmm. and very much a John that's Wesley right. yes. Wesleyan Methodist some ways, yeah. like you have to teach the children, mm-hmm. you have to have make sure they have the health and welfare, food, yes. and yes. because. If you're starving or yeah. you're sick and dying, you can share the gospel all you want, but yeah. uh, it's kind of hard to receive yeah, but any come, good news. And Come to think of it, you're a pastor, you're ministering to the people that are sick and dying. <laughs> what, do I, what, how is your church going to look like? Mm-hmm. You have maybe this Sunday four people in church because the other ten are absent, they are sick. Or they are hungry, they have gone to look for jobs, to look for food. So you need to be holistic in the way we mm. do ministry, reaching mm. the entire person with all the three aspects of a human being, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Yeah, yeah. That's great. You had talked about just the vulnerability of women and girls and then children in, in that community. Can you tell me the context, like why so many vulnerable folks? Yeah, because we had a generation that was wiped out by HIV and AIDS. Mm. And um, those children were left with grandparents and these grandparents are weak bodied. They cannot work in the farms. Mm. Their bodies are weak, or maybe they don't have the energy. They don't have the resources to work in the field. Mm. So these children become vulnerable because they don't have anybody to feed them. And that's oh. why you, if you go across Africa now, you find a lot of cases of street, street children. Yeah, because there's nobody to take care of them in the homes. Mm. And in some cases, you, have, you find a lot of child headed household. 14 year old child taking care of a 13 year old sibling because they've, wow. lost, they've lost either their parents or their grandparents cannot take care of them. Mm. Yeah. And so your ministry really feels, fills in that, that space of like that, that not just a gap, but that, that chasm of vulnerability. Yeah, I, I believe that's what the church should be. Yeah. I believe that's what church should be. A church should is supposed to fill in that. But what we've created church today is diff- totally different thing. Mm. I, I, I believe we're not doing the Jesus model to ministry. What oh. we are doing is something we've created our own. But if we look at the model that Jesus had, look at Matthew chapter 9. Action packed back to back. He's busy healing this person, healing that person, doing that. 
he never said i'm busy he never said oh i'm going wait for me or you are blind okay just wait here i'm coming no he stopped he listened and did something in mm. every situation jesus stopped listened and did something mm. and if we are christians christ like mm-hmm. who is our master who are we following mm. what did he do that's beautiful yeah he moved to the point of the need what one of the things i think it a lot of people well most of the people who will listen to this podcast and learn about your ministry are from america I, I think Americans, and I know I, my, I know enough to be dangerous and not that much, <laughs> but having friends who are pastors or bishops in Africa and, and hearing from them, talk just about um, what life is like in an African country between living day in and day out for people. I, I, I just don't know. Mm. I'm asking this because I just don't know that most people in the United States of America understand or realize what it's mm. like to live in another country where there's a lot more people over there living in contexts like this than over here. Yeah. And sometimes we think we're the only ones in the world and this, it's all, everybody's sure. like us. And it's not, it's not that way. Mm. You, you've been here to the United States, yes. so you can at least kind of see some of what do you, how would you share with someone from the United States to say, here, here's how life is different for the vast majority of people in Africa, or at least in Malawi. Where you yeah. Are. Coming this side of the world sometimes make me makes me f- feel sad and mad about life itself because mm. I see the disparities. I see how huge a gap is there is. There's a huge gap. You call it um, a huge gap that uh, that that is there. Back home, we you don't know where your next meal is gonna come from. You don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. So we live by faith. Mm. Back in Africa, we live by faith. We trust God every moment we take. Tomorrow, whether I find food, whether there will be food, I don't know. But f- the, by my God is going to provide. But here, you turn it up. There's hot water. There's warm water. There's cold water. You do everything. I, for example, I want to tell you that uh, I go to functions here. They invite me, they say, for dinner or s- uh, lunch. And then they tell you, you go in a big table and there's, there's a lot of food you need to choose. Uh, do you want this? Are you going to eat this? Uh, so many choices. Back home is one choice. Either you eat, you take that, or you starve and die. Mm. So I believe uh, we much we live by faith. While here, I have seen that I think it's dying. It's like uh, you have it readily available. And sometimes I, I take people that don't think that whatever they have is coming from God. They feel yeah. it's, it's just they have it themselves it's out of their labor out of their intelligence out of whatever they do no it's not that god Mm. has given you that we need to realize that no matter how rich you are all those resources have been given to you by god God. yes he's the provider and he wants you to be a good steward by the way Mm -hmm. and he wants you to realize who he is the source he's the provider because what you know the, the very basic foundation of it all is life. <laughs> Once you don't have life, you don't have anything. And who is the giver of life? God. Is God. Hmm. The moment you realize that the giver of life is God, then you know that everything that you have originates from God. And if it's originated from God, you need to give thanks to Him hmm. whenever you wake up in the morning. I don't hmm. see that here. Maybe very few people would do that. But I can challenge you in Africa, I can challenge you in Malawi. Even my, my own very kids, they know that, yes, that does mean but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know if we'll have food tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I, I just I, I just I appreciate you sharing and translating across culture, because I do think we and I'm not afraid to say this. I mean, we are a very rich nation. We have way more than we need. We have, you know. And if there's something you don't need, all you got to do is go on Amazon and order it, and it'll be on your doorstep by in the morning between 4 and 8 a.m., right? <laughs> and I think that does something to your understanding of dependency. Yes. Uh, mm-hmm. Having to have faith, mm-hmm. having to depend on faith. You know, we're, we're going through the farewell discourse, and this week, you know, Jesus is talking about, um, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit will Should come. come. Yes. And you're going to go under a lot of persecution and you're going to face a lot of difficult days. But take courage, for I have conquered. Yes. And I think, 
I listen to that and I'm, I've been struggling all week. How am I going to preach this mm. message to the people that listen? Mm. You don't ha- that, that, you know, it does take a lot of convincing for you to preach that message yeah. to say, hey, take courage. Jesus has mm. already conquered. So mm. each step, each moment mm. um, is very different than when our biggest concern is what? Fill in the blank. My, you know, my biggest fear is, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well. I, my boat needs to be repaired or my yeah, uh, vacation right. house, uh, the air conditioning broke in my vehicle. Yeah. I don't want to sound dismissive of, of people here, but I just think huh. that's what gets in the way mm. of, of real and authentic faith. And then when yes. things, when we do go through difficult times, and we've seen that in the United States, when you go through COVID and you go through pandemic and you go through crises or racial divisions or political unrest people don't know how to deal with difficulty because mm. we've never had to really deal with difficulty no. you never know it you don't and we're know very it. selfish it's so if we if we get in an argument with each other i'm gonna hate you yeah I'm, I'm right and you're wrong and this this is how we do it and i just think man we, we could learn so much mm. from the rest of the world yeah um and depending upon god and learning to count our blessings yeah and learning how to deal with adversity and taking courage in difficult situations. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Basically, I've been sharing um, Matthew chapter 9. Mm. I'm taking that as an example pretty much because we, as, a, as a society, we become so busy. We are so busy with our different things. We're so busy. You don't want to talk to your neighbor. You're so busy. You don't want to listen to somebody in church. You're so busy. It's, it's all about me, 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 and you just want to be on the go. But I'm like, let's, let's, let's take a step. Let's just wait. Let's just stop just for a moment, listen, and do something. It could be a neighbor just in the neighborhood, just a neighbor next door. Do we take time to just listen? They may be going something very terrible. Mm. But as Christians, we are the first ones that are not even stopping to listen and doing something. Mm. And... Because of that, the world has become even more broken. Wow. That's, that seems to be the gospel, to stop, to listen, and to do something. Yes. Which means that um, we have to be distractible, yes. right? Mm-hmm. That I have, I'm, I've got something to do today mm-hmm. that maybe the Holy Spirit shows up and yes. asks me to stop, yes. listen, yes. and be distractible, yes. to do something about mm-hmm. the need I see in the world. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I was thinking about um, as you were sharing, I was thinking about the Lord's Prayer. Yes. And um, we say this in our church every week, uh, at least when we have communion. No, every week um, that phrase, give us this day our I daily bread. Yes. And when you're in a country that can open up a refrigerator mm. and you have weeks of bread in it, we also then don't ask the question, whose bread am I eating? Right. Mm. We just think, oh, this is my bread. I made this bread. This is for me, my family. But I I wonder if the next stage of the gospel is to be distractible, to open up our refrigerator and and wonder there's people in your community today. There's 4000 students, Mm. people, children, vulnerable children that will come and eat um, at your table Mm. and who who for that prayer is their lifeblood. God, give us today bread mm. right that's not a metaphor no <laughs> in the west we've turned that into a <laughs> metaphor <laughs> yeah so uh, talking about the affluence and the food uh. i have one weird example i was uh. when i was coming here uh, in chicago airport i had a layover i was supposed to connect and then i i was so hungry i needed to have a bite and um, i have five dollars in my wallet I go from restaurant to restaurant trying to find if I can only find French fries and maybe a soda, mm. that will that will help. There's no way I didn't find anything for five dollars. Mm-hmm. I had to put it back in my pocket because I knew back home I'm feeding one child per month with three dollars. So I said, let me reserve my five dollars and use it back home. <laughs> and that's a month and a half or a month is for five bucks. Three dollars. Three dollars. Three dollars for yeah, a month I'm, I'm for a child for a month. W- yes. And you can't buy fries for five dollars no, in the not airport. In, in not Chicago in the airport. airport. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah. 
Well, um, I really appreciate you coming to share. One of the things that I would like for us to, Jeff will put in the show, like the, in the notes when people watch this. Yes. But tell us if people want to be supportive yeah. of the, the ministry, um, how, can, how would you direct people in that way if they were listening to uh, this podcast? Yeah, so um, they can give online. Uh, we have a website. They can go to Abundant Life Center Malawi. dot mm-hmm. org. Uh, I'll give you the details. They can just go there. There's a donate button. You can donate online, and then the funds come directly to us. Mm. Um, Some yeah, great pictures here too. I'll give them to Jeff. Yes, um, that that you have mm-hmm. that we'll use. We'll probably get him to edit some of these in during the podcast as well if you're watching on youtube but yes yeah abundant life center um and we'll have the information and the links in the podcast notes whether you're listening or watching but we're really glad that you're here in houston yeah uh, at least for a little while when do you go back i i, I leave tomorrow morning. Um, tomorrow morning i'm heading i'm headed to to fredericksburg because uh, i'm preaching on sunday at fredericksburg united methodist okay they've given me all the three services they am um, so excited though i'm tired but i <laughs> i know the lord is going to use me in a special fredericksburg. way fredericksburg yeah. wow that's great I'm yeah glad, i'm glad you're going over there you're glad i'm glad those, you're those going, people no, need, glad I, you're going. I, I they need jesus you. over there yeah. Moses. <laughs> Fred Jixbury, that's a oh, yeah. godforsaken pagan oh, yeah? part of tech. No, no, wow. they're good folks. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you're going to be speaking at the foundation dinner, yeah. and I'm glad that our foundation is is supporting you and the great work you're doing. You're very, it's a very inspiring yeah. story, mm-hmm. but it's also, I hope, something that can awaken a lot of the people that would listen, and if they would share this with other people to hear your story, I think it would be a benefit to our own faith Yes, as we, we grow mm-hmm. in our own faith. So... Thank you. Moses, we have a way that, uh, well, let me just say, if you, uh, if you like, make sure you like and subscribe, share this podcast. You may know someone who likes, to, who would, needs to hear this story. Yeah. Or maybe this, especially this conversation about faith in the United States versus the reality of, of faith in some places around the world that maybe share that with a friend. So yeah, that just right. to gain some, some perspective, yeah. right? Uh, someone that you know may need to, may, may be uplifted by hearing that. And so it'd be good. We have a way we sign off on the podcast. We just basically say our name. So yeah. I say, I'm John Stevens. I'm Moses Njovo. And I'm Matt Russell. He said it so smooth. He's smooth. <laughs> He's smooth. <laughs> and this is Pod Have Mercy. <laughs>